we're, we're building our, our little matrix here. Concentration. Like I say, concentration is not, we don't perceive concentration, but different concentrations of odorants can affect the way we smell something. Some things that are low concentration smell one way, and higher concentration smell another way. That's kind of a strange phenomenon that's hard to, hard to quantify. But there are two things. There's the detection level, and there's the recognition level. If I said that hydrogen sulfide was in this room to the detection level, what does that mean to you? I, there's something in here, but I don't know what it is. But if it's hydrogen sulfide, I probably don't like it. Okay? If it's reached the recognition level, it's, by God, I don't like it, and it's hydrogen sulfide, I better get out of here because, you know, I'm smart enough to know that if I can smell hydrogen sulfide, it's probably going to kill me if I walk into a manure storage, for instance. Okay. So, going back to our visual visualization scheme, what is this? It's a blue note. What kind of a blue note? Top note, because it's nice and, nice and thin. It's ammonia. It's our top note. So our top blue note is ammonia. This is ammonia at the recognition level. Not only can you see it, but you recognize it as ammonia with a little problem from your, from your teacher. The recognition of ammonia is about 37,000 parts per billion. I say about. Josh Payne, who does our, our poultry training, will say, no, it's 20,000. Go down the hall, somebody else say, oh, it's 15,000. This is not exact science. And you're going to learn in a little bit, a little bit when you do the experiment is really not exact. But in a room this size, 37,000 parts per million is going to be about that much. If I was to shake this and then distribute it in the room, you would smell ammonia. You would smell something and you'd say, that's ammonia. And probably Leslie and and Laura will be keeling over because it, it's pretty strong for them in the front. Okay. So if that's ammonia, what is this? How many can, how many can see something on the, the screen? It's a fly speck. It's blue, so it could be scat. It could be ammonia. It's at the detection level. This is actually supposed to be ammonia at the detection level. You smell something, but you're not sure what it is. You don't know if it's scat or if you know it's ammonia. You probably don't even know if it's skunk or ammonia, okay, because it's so low. In this room, that's going to be about like that, okay? It doesn't take much. Some of these very potentially dangerous compounds we can detect at very low levels like hydrogen sulfide. When we're talking to poultry producers, the acute ammonia hazard is 50 to 100,000 parts per million. That means your eyes are going to water, you're going to feel burning in the lungs, you're probably going to want to get out of there. You know. yeah, your, your brain says, this ain't good, I'm getting out of there. So that's twice the recognition level, more or less. Two rings. The problem we have a lot of times is that the chronic exposure level of ammonia is below, it's above the detection limit, but below the recognition level. Okay? I tell poultry farm, I'm a, I am a middle-aged asthmatic. If I come to your poultry farm, first I'm going to wear a dust mask, because if I don't wear a dust mask, I'm going to be hacking for the rest of the week. And I probably will avoid going in your house altogether. Okay, because I know it's going to bother me. It's, it's an irritant that, that's going to affect my asthma. Um, but the, what's dangerous to poultry farmers is they go into their house day after day. They don't smell it. They don't smell any ammonia. It's not hurting me. But it could be actually hurting them, even though it's below the, below the recognition level. But they smell something. Okay. Now, one of the great, life's great ironies, if you go to OSU... If you go to Oklahoma State University and you know the good football rivalries in the United States, our cross-the-state rival is OU, Oklahoma University. And it just so happens that OU is how we measure odor concentration in notes. So the freshmen, they pick up that right away. So OU is odor concentration. 
OK. We generally use a method called olfactometry. Now, I'm not going to propose, I'm not going to say that I'm an expert in olfactometry. So this is kind of an overview. So olfactometry, and I think this quote goes all the way back to 2000, the first Bush-Gore election. Olfactometry is a lot like choosing presidents. What matters is the opinion and the majority. Okay? What we do with olfactometry, we actually use you as the detectors. We could go out there with major mass spec and grab the sample and, and find out what the concentration is. But what we actually do with olfactometry, we get a group of people and we present the odors to them and ask them what they think. Okay? And if half of them says it smells this way, that's the way it smells. So it's just like choosing your, your leader. Olfactometers come in a lot of different styles. It's the synchro, the ones that did the, uh, the, a lot of the olfactometers in the United States are made by synchro. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. This lady has got some kind of thing on her head. They're probably measuring her brain waves in response to the odor. This one we're going to talk about a little bit different, a little bit later. They give you seven different or seven or eight different options of, of smelling. So you're, you're trying to compare different smells and they come in all shapes and sizes. Basically, all they are, if you take, a, take away the, the outsides and look at the guts, a no factometer is nothing but an instrument that makes very precise dilutions of odorants with air that has gone through some kind of filtration so it doesn't have any odor. Okay? So it's just an instrument to presenting dilutions of odors to this panel or a panel. A lot of places, in fact, most places will have a panel. They'll go back to the same panel or same uh, population over and over again. Like when you're, uh, you're in the jury pool, you may get called to the jury. You may get called to be on no older panel. And they generally train them a little bit before they, they join the panel. Okay. So this is a nice code cord of farmstead odors, right? Is this is what y'all would perceive? You go into a hog barn, you're going to be seen using the visualization scheme that we've been talking about. Yes or no? So it's a nice little chord. You imagine the, the the angels with a harp. Oh, come on, guys! No, it looks like this. This is actually, and I go back in the notes. I can't remember the paper this came from. There was actually a group of people, scientists back in the 90s in Germany that took a sample of the air under the slats of hog barn and they analyzed it for every single odorant they could imagine and this is what it came out with. This is basically as good a representation as I could do taking the concentrations of say ammonia and if the recognition level is 37,000 parts per billion that's a heck of a lot more than 37,000 parts per billion, right? Okay. So if y'all smelled this, if they presented this to you an olfactometer, which they're not going to, by the way. What would you think you would smell? How would you react to this? Ammonia. There's lots of ammonia there. Very recognizable. There's some skunk there, too, though. You can see that there's a kind of a nice background of green. There's a heck of a lot of green, a lot of brown, a lot of scat. Basically, you would smell this and you'd be so overwhelmed you probably wouldn't be able to say what it was if you snuffed it right into your nose. Okay? You might be able to say, hey, that's a scum. I mean, that's a pig. That's definitely pig odor. So the olfactometer dilutes it up to gets it to something you can perceive a little bit better. Okay? This is a 1 in 10 dilution of that pig odor, more or less. Doing the best I could with taking away shapes. What do you think this would smell like to you? Do what? It'd smell like pig. It definitely smell like pig manure. You, if you sniffed at it long enough and you're one of these trained perfume people, you'd say, oh, I can smell the top notes of ammonia, you know, giving away to a gentle planty odor and the, the persistence of scat or something. But probably you'd smell that and you'd say, that's a very strong pig odor. Okay. So they're, they gave you a blank. They present you with a smell. They give you a nice relaxing blank. And they're going to give you another dilution. How about this one? What does this look like to y'all? What do you think you'd smell if you saw that?
you probably still smell pig. Okay? You might say, hey, that's kind of piggy. The other point is you definitely would see something, right? But you might not be able to say what it is. So it's above the detection limit, but maybe we're getting off the recognition. So actually, odors and odor runts both have detection and, and uh, recognition levels. Um, so you get in the picture here. They dilute it out. They give you a blank. They're going to dilute it again, but they don't do it sequentially. They're going to do it randomly, so you're off your guard. You know, you have to say, can I smell it or not, right? They're not going to give it to you. They say, oh, I don't think I can smell anymore. They're going to give you a 200, a 400, an 800. All right, another dilution. Show of hands, how many people can see something on the screen? Okay, so we got almost not only a majority, but it's unanimous. Y'all see something. At this point, it might smell like pig. Another blank. Show of hands. One in 1,000 dilution. Most of y'all probably three-fourths to eight-tenths. Blank, nothing there. Show of hands. Oh, come on, there's some old folks in here. I know. I mean, I'm the old, probably the oldest guy in the room. Blank. And I should give it to you really fast so you can't sit there staring at Okay. How many people saw something? It's almost all of you. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, we're getting almost everybody. Okay, we're almost down to, okay, 16,000. Usually, okay, you can see that there's some dots here, and there'll be some dots on the screen, you know, sometimes too. We're getting down in the range where it's kind of hard to tell whether you can see something or not. Usually, these 18, 19-year-olds, they can tell when they see something on the screen. Yeah, Leslie's like 18-year-old. No, she's like an 18-year-old. She can see But generally, I think most people would probably, about half of y'all would see the 16,000, half of you wouldn't. So the majority is still saying, I can see that. But then when you get down to 32,000 dilution, half of you wouldn't say anymore. So what we're saying now is we have diluted it to the threshold. Okay? And a lot of places that do this sort of thing, like University of Minnesota, that's basically how they report things. Dilution to threshold. And actually in all the modeling they do, they say five miles down the road, they can still perceive it at dilution to threshold. Okay? An OU is just the inverse of the dilution to threshold. So if we diluted that sample 16,000 times and y'all still could smell it, or 50% of you could still smell it, take to the inverse of 1 over 16,000, the original sample had an OU of 16,000. So that particular pig odor, with my manipulation and, and working with y'all, doing a mock olfactometry, we said this original smell had an OU of 16,000. OUs and dilution to threshold are really good because you can put them right in dispersion models and you can, you can model the movement of odors across the landscape. And that's basically the limit to most of what we do. That's as far as we take it. Okay? Uh, this is some, they can use the same models we use for smokestacks, for instance. EPA will have, there's a model called Puffer that models the dispersion of smoke away from smokestacks or particulate models. Um, this is one that has, I think this is supposed to be a sewage treatment plant, or this is a sewage treatment plant, and they're modeling the plume of concentration going downstream from the sewage treatment plant, and they can say that this house here smells it. This house here doesn't smell it. Okay? It's beyond the dilution of threshold. The problem is we don't really smell concentration. We smell intensity. All right, there's a difference. There's a difference between concentration and intensity. Okay. Two methods of measuring intensity are the referencing supra threshold method, which is the real scientific way of doing it. Well, they're both pretty scientific. Um, and the descriptive scale. The referencing supra threshold, what they do is they compare an odor that we don't know how strong it is to a concentration of butanol, of one butanol, that we do have a pretty good idea how most people are going to respond 
into that odor. So when you do the referencing threshold, you're actually comparing it to a, a known concentration of butanol. And they use that instrument like the lady in Germany was doing. They'll give you a smell and they have eight dilutions of butanol. And they, sell, they ask you, which one of these does it smell most like? Okay. Oh, and that's a Dr. Lim down in Missouri. This is at Purdue. They actually use the same crow. I like to show that. I hope he's in the audience. You can see the bald spot on top. I got that off the web. They published it. Anyway, uh, you need about, uh, I think the, this is actually an ASTM and a ISO method. I can't give you the number. It's not on there. Um, you have to have at least eight sniffers. And this is showing the different sniffers at the, the, the different ports at which they smelled it. Okay? So this particular smeller said, I would rate it the same strength as a number six, which turns out to be a 388 part per million volume dilution of butanol. So what they do is they take that and then they'll go back, they do some math, they take the, the average and standard deviation, and then they do a log transformation. They say, this odor had a 2.02 .02 log smell of butanol to it. So it's very, it can be a very precise method. Another equally precise, if they do it right, way of measuring strength is you basically give a dilution to some a group and you say rate it. And the usual scale is a 0 to 6 or a 0 to 10. And there is a correlation between concentration and intensity. Lo and behold. This is uh, Misselbrooks. He's an Englishman, I guess back in probably in the early 90s they did this. He comes to some of these conferences every now and then. I didn't see him here today. Basically, they took some hog odor. I think what they did is they spread it on the ground. They had like a wind tunnel and they started circulating it. And the longer they circulated, they presented smells to people. And at 1 in 100 dilution, the average bunch of people would say, oh, it's between a 3 and a 4. It's distinct or strong. Okay. So basically, you give them a whole bunch of dilutions, and they say, on a scale of 0 to 6, this is strong or this is weak. Okay? And they can do very precise measurements that way. So we can go back to our modeling with the concentration and say, oh, if it had, a dilute, if it had an odor concentration of 80 OUs, well, it must, they must smell it as being very distinct or distinct at that point, right? It's not so simple because every single odor has its own characteristic. Okay, they are usually a linear correlation on the log base ten of the concentration, but there'll be different reactions. There'll be the, some odors are stronger than the other. They're not stronger. I mean, the concentration is the same, but you perceive it as a stronger odor. Does that make sense? For instance, if we had a 1 in 100 dilution and we had hog manure, which is the red, people would say, in this case, it was, again, somewhere between distinct and strong. But the green is poultry litter, the exact same concentration. They would say, oh, that's very strong or strong. Okay? This is probably where the poultry producers don't like it. Why is poultry litter smell? What you would think would be the other way around. Why? Most people, most people don't like the smell. Well, that's a pers that's a fairly cultural, culturally ingrained attitude. Doesn't sound right. Most people in the United States, Canada, Mexico would say pigs smell bad. You know, worse than chickens. Okay, but I just showed you that poultry litter is actually stronger smelling at the same concentration. Why is that? Even though they would probably still say pig smells worse. Right, it's that ammonia coming back to get you. It's the Hannah Man Montana perfume of manures. Okay. Uh, if you came back a day later, it may not smell as strong. The, the pig manure, which has a lot of base notes in it, would smell stronger probably. Yeah. So then we have a we go back to the character issue. That doesn't sound right. The 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 character of a smell, and since most of the time in agriculture were well in litigation type agriculture we only care whether it smells good or bad 
So the measure is offensiveness. How bad does this smell? Okay. And usually they're going to use uh, something similar to intensity. They will uh, present to this panel, you're usually comparing one to another. You want to know if this process made it smell worse or better, right? Smelled less offensive or had any effect at all. So you're going to give them samples at the same intensity, present it to the panel, and then they're going to rate it 0 to 6. Okay? Why do you have to dilute it to the same intensity? Wrong you are. According to science, or according to the people who do this, offensiveness is an intrinsic property of the odor. Okay? If a skunk smells bad, strong, it smells bad if it's weak. Y'all buy that? You buy that? Still going to smell bad. So you would rate a six to a strong smelling skunk and six to a weak smelling skunk. 